Transfield. I'm for Selectman in Portland, and thank you, everyone, for coming. We have a presentation tonight, and I have some written comments, and I also have um, the opportunity, of course, for the public to speak tonight. So first, I'm going to start with why we're here. Uh, there'll be a notice that was uh, given to us in terms of this being a public information meeting. And then I'll read the legal notice of the public hearing as well, just so that everybody knows why we're here and what we're doing. Notice is hereby given pursuant to section 16-50G of the Connecticut General Statutes of a public information meeting to be held in the Mary Flood Room at the Portland Library, 20 Freestone Avenue, Portland, Connecticut, on Wednesday, September 17, 2014, beginning at 7 p.m. The meeting will be in furtherance of a technical report on file with the Town of Portland for a proposal by New Singular Wireless PCS LLC, AT&T, to construct a wireless telecommunications tower facility at the property near Collins Hill Road, Assessors Map 51, Lot 8, with access by way of 9 Rose Hill Road in the town of Portland. The tower would be located in the central portion of this property and is proposed to extend to an overall height of 85 feet above grade. Proposed camouflaging will resemble an evergreen tree. The property is an approximately 4.29 acre parcel which is currently undeveloped, adjoining the existing Quarry Ridge Golf Course. The facility is proposed to allow AT&T to provide wireless service in this area of Portland. At this meeting, AT&T's representatives will discuss the need for the facility, the location of existing surrounding facilities, and identify the review of potential environmental effects of the proposed facility. The public informational meeting is being conducted at the request of the Town of Portland in advance of a formal application to be filed with the State of Connecticut Siting Council, which has jurisdiction over wireless tower facilities. Now, but you also notice this as a public hearing so that everyone would know this was being held. And this legal notice was in the River East News Bulletin. And it's a legal notice of public hearing Board of Selectmen for Wednesday, September 17, 2014 at 7 o'clock in the Portland Library. And this is pursuant to Section 506 of the Portland Town Charter. A public hearing and information session will be held by the Board of Selectmen on Wednesday, September 17, 2014 at 7 p.m. to provide residents opportunity to comment both orally and in writing on the proposed wireless telecommunications tower facility to potentially be located at 9 Rose Hill Road. And this was dated the 27th of August, 2014, a test Susan Bransfield for selectmen. Now, I do have some written comments, but I think what we'll do is have the presentation first, and then the written comments, and then that gives the audience time to put their thoughts together and come forward. It is being recorded tonight, the session. So we ask when you do make your comments that you come up to the podium so that you can be seen and heard as is customary. We ask that you state your name and your address for the recording secretary, Laura Siena, um, who's taking the minutes for us. So at this point, I'm going to turn the meeting over to our presenters tonight, and they're going to do self-introductions, and we're going to learn a little bit more about this facility. Good evening, everyone. My name is Abigail Jewett, and I'm with the External Affairs Division of AT&T, based here in Connecticut. And I just wanted to uh, welcome you here this evening and thank you for coming out. The purpose of the, the forum this evening is to start off and give you as much information as we have about the site. And we're going to have our siting attorney come up and do a PowerPoint presentation. should last about 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, and then we have various experts uh, within the different fields responsible for siting for cell towers. So when you have questions, we have the right people here in the room to hopefully be able to answer some of those questions for you. 
The purpose really is to gather information from you and from the town. We want to thank the first selectman for, for allowing us and, and requesting this forum here tonight because what we're really hoping for is, is an exchange of, of information that's not only helpful to you, but helpful to us as, as we go forward. This is really the start of the process and really information gathering both on our end as well as, as for your end. So I know we have kind of an abbreviated amount of time here this evening because there is a Board of Selectmen meeting afterwards. So I'm gonna have Lucia come up and, and do the presentation and then afterwards, as the first selectman said, we'll take as many questions from you as you like. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lucia Kiokio. I'm with Cuddy and Fader, and we represent AT&T. Um, as Abby said, we'll go through um, the process of um, siting cell towers in the state of Connecticut. Um, and hopefully this will work from here. Ah, very good. Um, so we're gonna talk about um, our, our facility, our proposed facility and the process um, and answer any questions that, that may come up. So um, you heard from Abby Jewett. Um, I'm here from Cuddy and Fader. Um, Mr. Dan Goulet is the radio frequency engineer for AT&T. Um, we have uh, Steve Quinn from SmartLink. Um, instead of Adam Braylard. Uh, Jay Thibel from Chappelle Engineering. He is the engineer that um, designed the facility for AT&T. And Michael Libertine of All Points Technology, the visual consultant. So a little bit about wireless infrastructure and how uh, federal, state, and municipal um, entities have a role in, in wireless infrastructure. Um, so. Carriers like AT&T uh, conduct searches in areas where they've identified a need for a facility, um, a need being an area where there's not reliable wireless service for their customers. Um, the state siting policies and municipal wireless facility preferences typically include co-location on existing facilities. So the state statute encourages tower sharing and co-location on existing facilities. So the first thing that AT&T will do is identify this area of need and then try and identify any existing structures that they can use to fulfill that need. If none of those are available, if they've exhausted any, all the existing structures, typically you need a tall structure, then they'll look for um, a piece of property where they can site a tower facility to, to meet their needs. Um, with respect to jurisdiction, Local municipalities retain jurisdiction over attachments to water tanks, rooftop sites, and so forth. And in here in Connecticut, the Connecticut Siting Council has jurisdiction over new tower facility, facilities like the one we're proposing. And there are also some federal laws and policies that um, govern local and state uh, regulations with respect to wireless facilities to ensure that these facilities and the infrastructure can be built so that reliable services are available. So the application process in Connecticut starts with, as Abby said, this is the beginning of the process. So we started with the submission of what we call a technical report to the town of Portland. And that started our municipal consultation. So we haven't been to the siting council we're not going to the siting council until this consultation period is done. So we submit the um, technical report and um, we consult with the town of Portland. Then if AT&T decides to proceed to the siting council, they would submit an application to the siting council. The siting council will um, schedule a hearing here in the town of Portland. There's actually quite a bit of notice that, that that's involved in that process. So when we file our application with the Siting Council, there'll be notice in the paper, notice will go to the abutters that we intend to file. Once it's on file with the Siting Council, they'll schedule a public hearing here in the town, and that also will be something that would be noticed. They'll conduct a site visit, they'll have an evidentiary hearing in the afternoon, 
and a public hearing at night. And there are uh, several ways and opportunities to get involved in that siting council process. So here we just, just a little bit more on the uh, municipal consultation process. So we submitted our technical report in April. Um, we followed up with a visual analysis in August. Um, in some cases, you know, we meet with town officials. At this point, we had um, been in contact with your first selectman. Uh, we had talked about a balloon float, the visual materials, and then the town requested that we come here tonight um, and provide information about it and present at an information meeting. So this is a little bit tough to read, but um, I'll, I'll just give you a quick overview of what you're looking at here. Uh, wireless demand. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you that have wireless devices have realized that people are depending on their wireless devices more and more, whether it's for personal or business or even safety reasons. So what these statistics are showing you is that the demand is increasing exponentially for reliable wireless services. Um, and the chart on the right, uh, those are um, exabytes per month. So this is the amount of data that people are using per month. Um, and you can see from 2013 to 2018, it's going from 1.5 to a predicted 15.9. That's a lot of data. It's a lot of demand. Um, and the carriers are looking to try and meet that demand because people are relying so much on their wireless services. And some, this is just some of the, the things that I'm sure you know already, what, you know, what wireless service provides. Voice, text, E911, data, uh, you know, everyone's talking about being able to download at faster speeds, whether it's for personal or professional. Um, M2M stands for machine to machine. We're seeing a lot of this now with, within the healthcare industry where um, the wireless service is used, for example, if it's available, if there's a, 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 an accident and the EMT goes to the scene, they may be able to send information right to the hospital so that way when the patient gets to the hospital, they're all set up and they know what's going on. Just an example of some of the um, machine to machine uh, uses in the healthcare industry. Uh, transportation, there's you know other economic sectors. A lot of times I hear about retailers that use wireless services to help them regulate their, um, their inventory. And of course the public safety applications. Um, it, you know, there's, you hear it all the time, anecdotes about people being lost or having, being in an accident and being able to call and get help. So this chart shows, I can get my, ah, here we go. So here's our proposed site. And what these little balloons are showing are existing infrastructure in and around the area. And right around the proposed site are existing towers or infrastructure. If we move to our next slide. Maybe. Thanks, Mike. So what you're looking at here is what we call a radio frequency propagation plot. And this is uh, the result of analysis by AT&T's radio frequency engineer. Um, so here you have the proposed site. These indicate existing sites around the area, and those are just site numbers for AT&T. Um, and what you're seeing on the green and the kind of orangey color is signal level. Green represents the um, reliable signal level or reliable service. Orange, the next best level. The white areas, there may be signal there, but it's not reliable. What does that mean? That means you may be able to make a call, but you may not be able to hold that call. Um, you most likely won't be able to 
um, sustain any kind of data usage in that area. So if we go to our next slide, so what you're seeing here, it's the same, same setup. Here's the proposed site, and here's the predicted coverage from that site. So this is showing you what the anticipated reliable service would be from that particular facility. Can we go to the next one, Mike? And this is just the same as before, but at a different frequency. AT&T has um, several frequencies. And then if you just go to the next one, Mike, thanks. And then just the next, thank you. So um, this is what, this is a terrain plot, and this kind of helps explain a little bit about uh, wireless service. So here's our proposed site. Um, as I said earlier, the um, carriers typically look for existing infrastructure before um, they propose a new tower facility. In this case, there's a CLMP um, route right here. So these are three, these represent three CLMP structures. So first thing AT&T did, let's take a look at these structures. And the RF engineers analyze these structures and determine that because of their location, um, you can see here that they're kind of in a valley. If this represents 400 feet, and you've got like 300 feet, and then 200 feet, because they're so low in the valley, they're not tall enough to provide the service. The RF signal won't penetrate through this area, so it kind of gets stuck in there. Um, the other location that they looked at was here, which is the, um, the parking lot for the um, clubhouse. Um, however, our, our property owner preferred the location um, that was selected here. So, so what we're showing you basically is, you know, the reason why the CLMP structures don't work is due to their low elevation in relation to um, the proposed site. Um, that's, that's fine, Mike, we can just, so this is a little hard to see, that says site. So here's our site, as far as the aerial map is concerned. And we can. So this is um, a, an overview. The black line that I'm kind of going around here is the proposed access route, which is an existing, um, uh, golf path through the golf course. And then our proposed site is here on this adjacent piece of property to the golf course, which is a little over four acres in size. If you go to the next one, Mike, thank you. So the proposal is, so here's a little close-up of where, where it is. So it's, that would be the access drive. It would be a 50 by 50 foot area. And the monopole or the the monopine, I should say, is located here in the middle of that area. And it's, it's sort of in the middle of this piece of property. I think there's, can you go back one, I think, Mike, or no? No? Okay, thanks. So the proposal includes um, a monopine that would be 85 feet tall. Some branches would stick up a few more feet so that, you know, it looks more like a tree. A tree just doesn't stop at the top. Um, antennas would be located at about 80 feet uh, center line. It's designed for co-location by other carriers. As I said earlier, the state statutes uh, require and encourage um, co-location. So if we're proposing a new tower facility in Connecticut, we have to design it so that other people can share it. Um, the compound would consist of um, an equipment shelter. It's unmanned equipment. The shelter is about 12 feet by 16 feet. Um, a backup generator. And the entire compound would be enclosed by an eight foot chain link fence. So 
one of the when we apply to the Connecticut Siding Council, we would be seeking a certificate of um, public need and environmental compatibility. So what that means is we have to demonstrate to the Siding Council that there's a need for the facility, which we talked about earlier with the plots. Um, and we also have to do our due diligence with respect to environmental impacts. And we have to look at several different um, environmental factors. And one of the factors that we have to do is we have to demonstrate that our facility meets all the applicable um, federal and state regulations with respect to um, RF energy. So what I have here on this slide is a little bit of information about, um, if you want more information about it, uh, with respect to the um, RF energy. But, but in general, when you have a facility um, such as the tower we propose, the RF energy um, associated with that facility decreases exponentially as you move away from the facility. So for this particular facility, um, the RF engineer did a calculation, and this is based on the, um, the federal guidelines. And the federal guidelines are a worst case scenario. So the federal guidelines say, take your facility, highest power, point the antennas down, which you, we wouldn't do because if you're pointing the antennas down, then the signal's going into the ground, and we want the signal to go out to the horizon to provide service. Um, and do this calculation and make sure that you're not at 100%. So we did that calculation for AT&T for our proposal, and that's the height of the antenna, and there's a lot of input. And we're at 12.36% of that 100%. So we're at a fraction of what the maximum um, exposure level would be based on, on the federal guidelines. And one of the other things we looked at is um, visibility. And this is a view shed map. It's a little hard to read, but the areas that are this orangey color are predict areas of predicted visibility. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to see the entire thing. Most often, particularly with a, with a facility that's not very tall, as these facilities go, um, you may see the top portion of it. Uh, and then we have some numbers here. I don't know if you can see them, but the numbers are in this area. And what they represent are locations where photos were taken. So we flew a balloon. Um, and you can see the balloon is here, right? So that's Bartlett Street. We flew a balloon um, and then created what we call a photo simulation so here is what the facility would look like as a tree in, from that location. And the next one, the arrows here. And then if you see, the facility is here. Same thing, the arrow. So that would be the balloon. And then the facility. Once again, the balloon, and then the facility. Right here, and right here. So, um, and just so you know, the balloon that's flown is a typically a three foot diameter red balloon, so that way, you know, they can see it and they uh, create the simulations. Um, so with that, I think we'll um, turn it back over to okay. First Selectman and we'll um, here to answer any questions. I am going to, before we get to questions, thank you, we will um, listen to a couple of um, comments and a report. I'm going to start with a report from the town engineer and um, it was directed to our town planner. And can everybody hear okay? I know there's other things going on outside, but everything is okay. All right. 
Dear Mrs. Rhodes, as requested, we have reviewed the following information for the subject project. Item one, a letter from Daniel Laub of Cuddy and Fetter to Susan Bransfield, dated August 11, 2014. Item two, set of three letter size plates titled Lease Exhibit S3477E, Portland Rose Hill Road, 9 Rose Hill Road, Portland, including property plan, site plan, and compound plan, sheets one, two, and three of four, dated October 28, 2013, prepared by Chapel Engineering Associates, LLC. And item three, two-page document titled Visibility Analysis, Portland Rose Hill Road, Portland, Connecticut, Middlesex County, dated July 2014, prepared by All Points Technology Corporation of Killingworth, Connecticut. As you are aware, residential properties located at the base of Collins Hill along the east side of Rose Hill Road and Collins Hill Road, and in particularly immediately to the north and south of the Bartlett Street intersection, have experienced severe drainage problems. Since these properties are directly down gradient of the proposed, quote, access area, end quote, end quote, equipment compound, end quote, we are concerned with any proposed improvements that would increase surface runoff and would therefore recommend that existing surface conditions be maintained to the greatest extent possible and that appropriate mitigation measures be employed to ensure that there is no increase in surface runoff. We have the following general comments in this regard. Number one, sheet one of four and item two above appears to indicate that access to the equipment compound will follow the route of the existing paved golf cart path. However, there is no indication whether any widening of the existing golf cart path will occur in order to accommodate vehicles and equipment necessary for both the construction as well as further service of this facility. We don't close, so <laughs> we will stay open. Given existing drainage problems, we would be opposed to any widening of the existing golf cart course path with pavement or other impervious surface. A possible alternative, if widening is deemed to be necessary, might be some type of modular grid system that would provide structural support for wheel loadings and maintain the existing grass structure and runoff characteristics. A similar type treatment should also be utilized where a gravel drive is proposed to extend in a southerly direction from the existing golf cart path to the proposed equipment compound. Number two, within the equipment compound, we would recommend that impervious surfaces be limited in size to the greatest extent possible and that they be connected to subsurface infiltration chambers located in an area with suitable subsurface conditions. Size to accommodate the increase in surface runoff from a 100 year storm event. In addition, any remaining area within the compound that cannot for operational purposes be revegetated should be surfaced with crushed stone to promote infiltration into the underlying soil structure. Should you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me, Jeffrey Jacobson, professional engineer with Nathan Jacobson Associates of Chester. And then I had one telephone call um, from Mr. Bill Larson, who was unable to be here tonight. Bill Larson is from 171 Bartlett Street, and he had just one comment, and that is that no additional water be put on the adjoining properties as a result of any structure. And then the second item that I have is um, as follows. Dear Susan, attached is a petition opposing 9 Rose Hill Road as the site for the proposed cell phone tower. This was circulated only to residents on Collins Hill, only the neighbors closest to the site on Rose Hill Road, and a few on Upper Bartlett Street Extension. Some residents were not available. 
Of the ones contacted, all signed except for a few who were undecided or were in favor of the site. Please make, make clear this was not circulated throughout the town. And I will read to you the petition. Cuddy and Feta, representing New Singular Wireless PCS, is currently considering the installation of an 80-foot tall cell tower to be located at 9 Rose Hill Road in Portland, adjacent to the Quarry Ridge Golf Course. We are strongly opposed to the installation of the tower for the following reasons. Whereas the neighborhood is strictly residential with two golf courses, with no commercial aspect, as stated in the April 7, 2014 Cutter, Cuddy and Fetter letter. Therefore, this neighborhood is not conducive to a commercial cell phone tower. Whereas the current real estate market is very fragile and reacts to any perceived adverse effect. An installation of a cell phone tower in this neighborhood will cause property values to decline even further than they already have and will affect homeowners in the surrounding properties as well as the local real estate market. Whereas the development of Quarry Ridge Driveway, Quarry Ridge Golf Course, and more recently the paving of a driveway that was to remain gravel has increased the flow of groundwater runoff, thereby causing serious drainage problems to surrounding property owners. And whereas the paving of the gravel driveway that was to remain gravel has resulted in a major lawsuit between the town of Portland and the owner of the paved driveway, this lawsuit affects many surrounding property owners, is ongoing, and therefore unresolved. Whereas the 12 foot wide, 650 foot long road that is proposed to access the site and the development of the land for the tower, tower will require the cutting of many mature trees and major excavation would cause even more groundwater runoff than already exists. Whereas no engineering studies have been completed stating the effect this project would have on surrounding properties and what the groundwater calculations would be. Whereas 25 AM JUR 2D easements and licenses section 76 states when a drainage easement exists surface water may be drained from the same area as that at the time the easement was originally granted Krukowski versus Glastonbury 16 Connecticut I believe it's superior 24 27 through 28 1948 but the drainage area may not be enlarged. The proposed project would involve at least two easements. Whereas an 80-foot tower is incompatible with the neighborhood aesthetics. This is an upscale residential neighborhood, and although the tower is intended to resemble a tree, it is clearly not one and would be an eyesore. Whereas Curtin Scientific research does not yet provide clear evidence that radio frequency radiation from cell phone towers poses a health risk. Research in this field is ongoing. The FCC standards were established in 1996 and the data used at that time are outdated. The World Health Organization has labeled RF a possible carcinogen and says further studies need to be done. In 2009, a meta-study conducted by seven scientists in five countries concluded that health effects from RF occur at exposure levels many orders of magnitude below existing public safety standards and that children are affected more strongly than adults. For the sake of the many children who live in this neighborhood, we should err on the side of caution where potential health issues are concerned. Therefore, for all the above reasons, we respectfully and adamantly request that the proposal <coughs> to install this cell phone tower be denied. Now, I don't know if you want me to read all these names, but I will, so I will. Um, Sharon Hoy, Bill 
Evalu Ellison? I can't read that name. I think it says Evalu. Evison. Thank you. Amy Evison. Eileen LaPrince. Bill Larson. Evelyn Larson. Brett Salafia. Elizabeth Salafia. Ramiro D'Souza. Kirsten Wessler. John Sobsik. Catherine Ray. Jillian Kapalin, Jameson Kapalin, Connie Dugolevsky, Al Dugolensky, Michael Corpio, ja Jamie Corpio, Joseph Story, Audrey Brady, Mike Kala, Joyce Murphy, Carolyn Freeman, David Freeman, Mark Chester, Kelly Chester, Sandra Pinto, Melissa Satage, Sandy Favalli, David Favalli, Rita Nicky, Sean Quinn, Bonnie Quinn, Jeff Spooner, Amy Spooner, Ruth McGowan, Richard Pistrito, Carolyn Personette, Jason Pierce, Susan Kenny, Conrad Hank, Linda Hank, Philip Hoy, Eileen Sullivan, John Sullivan, Matt Roman, maybe Romano, I'm not sure, Chris Nolan, Ellen Nolan, Julie Nolan, Tim Nolan, Lynn Nolan, Susan Pistrito, and David Pellet. Now all of these names are people who live in Portland and all of their addresses are listed here. I know most of them. I do know that um, just about everybody does live in Portland. Um, and that is all that I have for written comments tonight. So as we do um, for our public information and public hearings, I start on one section of the room and we go to each aisle and if you have comment or questions, raise your hand. And as I said earlier, if you could go to the microphone and let everybody know your name and address, um, our recording secretary will take that down. So we're going to start with the first row here and we'll go to the second row and the third row. Sharon? Sharon Hoy, 33 Rose Hill Road in Portland. Uh, I have a prepared uh, letter that was written before this meeting, so some of the questions and some of the things that are expressed may have already been answered. Although there is a need for better cell phone reception in some areas, the tower proposed for 9 Rose Hill Road is not an appropriate location. This is an upscale residential neighborhood with two golf courses and with no commercial business. The real estate market is very fragile and has already been stagnated, resulting in lower prices due to a sluggish economy. As a real estate agent, I have seen buyers lose interest in a house that is for sale as soon as they see things like a high power line, a water tank, a gas line, and yes, even a cell phone tower nearby. Whether right or wrong, there is growing concern about possible health hazards resulting from tower emissions. Any house in close proximity to this proposed cell phone tower could see a devaluation of their property. A Cuddy and Fetter letter dated April 7, 2014, indicated that several other locations were considered for the tower, and this has been answered. I would like to know where those parcels are and why they weren't selected. Since there will be income for the owner of the land on which the tower resides, it would make good business sense to have the tower located on the town land so that the town would benefit from the revenue. This could result in a savings that could be passed on to the taxpayer so everyone could benefit. If all town property locations have not been considered, I hereby request that the applicant work with the town to explore the opportunity of using one of the town parcels as a tower site. 
Although I am not an expert, I understand that the proposed site is the habitat for some endangered species. This needs to be studied, and if that is the case, we should not disturb this natural habitat. My biggest objection to the proposed location is groundwater runoff, not only on our property, but also on other neighboring properties. We owned our property since 1980 and never had a water problem until the Quarry Ridge Drive and golf course were developed. With acres of trees removed, massive excavation and paved drives and parking lots, the groundwater impacting our property has increased tremendously. Although we have never seen, never seen the Quarry Ridge Drive drainage plan, we believe that many, if not all, catch basins on the Quarry Ridge Drive collect the water from north and west of our land. It then goes underneath the road and discharges directly onto our property. There is no defined channel, so the water goes helter-skelter, causing major erosion until it reaches a swale and then goes into a town right-of-way, ending up in a catch basin on Rose Hill Road. What is interesting is that the golf course owns the land right next to ours, but instead of the water being channeled through that land, it is discharged onto our property. Why this was allowed by the town, we don't know. I am attaching a copy of a letter dated July 11, 1991 from Jeffrey Jacobson of Nathan L. Jacobson and Associates to Raymond Carpentino in which he expressed concern about the discharge from the existing culvert onto our property. And I quote, runoff to the Hoy property includes the overflow from the quarry as well as overland flow below the quarry. After development of the golf course, the area directly to the south of the quarry, which previously flowed overland to the Hoy property, will be diverted to the quarry. This diversion, along with the construction of the proposed dam, will serve to attenuate flows. To the best of my knowledge, this did not happen, and if it did, it did not solve the water problem since the groundwater runoff has been greatly increased. Now fast forward to 2013 and a situation that has compounded an, existing, an, an already existing water problem. When a house was built with the address known as One Rose Hill Road, there was a stipulation that it must have a gravel driveway to minimize groundwater runoff. This was the case until the summer of 2013 when the property owner paved the driveway. There is a catch basin at the bottom of this drive that collects the water from his property and driveway. Now the water from the one Rose Hill driveway mixed with the water collected from the golf course, the parking lots, and other paved areas is collected in the number of catch basins on Quarry Ridge Drive. All of this water continues southward to our property and then goes under, under the road and discharges directly onto our land resulting in major erosion. This has increased groundwater runoff to a dangerous level. I refer you to photos attached to this letter of a summer storm on August 30, 2013. All of the catch basins on that newly paved driveway, as well as all of the other catch basins on Quarry Ridge Drive, could not accommodate the water, which then flooded our land and ended up flooding Rose Hill Road. Surrounding property owners had similar situations, one in which the white water was shaking their propane tank so badly that their safety was at risk. When a situation becomes this serious, it requires immediate attention. However, that did not happen. From what I understand, there is now an unresolved lawsuit between the owner of One Rose Hill Road and the town of Portland. In the meantime, the water continues to be a problem to us as well as some of our neighbors. This will become even more of a problem if there is a severe storm that occurs in the winter when the ground is frozen and little if any of the groundwater runoff can be absorbed into the ground. This being said, the proposed 12-foot wide road and 650 long tower access road from Quarry Ridge Drive to the location of the proposed cell phone tower will undoubtedly result in road excavation and the cutting of many more trees. The cell phone tower project has the potential for causing even greater water problems for the neighborhood, and this is totally unacceptable. Into in the winter with snowstorms and with the groundwater runoff causing icing conditions on Quarry Ridge Drive, it will make it difficult, if not impossible, to plow and deal with the icing conditions. If that happens, how will the tower site be accessed for service, repair, or an emergency such as a fire or medical emergency? I would like to quote from case law Taylor versus Conti 
149 Connecticut 174, Supreme Court, 1962. A landowner cannot use or improve his land so as to increase the volume of the surface waters which flow from it onto the land of others, nor can he discharge surface waters from his land onto the land of others in a, a different course from their natural flow, if by so doing he causes substantial damage. This is exactly what has happened and will continue to happen to a greater degree if the cell phone tower application is approved. In my letter to Susan Bransfield and the Board of Selectmen dated May 29, 2014, the following questions were asked for which we would appreciate answers. How many trees will be cut and how much land will be disturbed by excavation to build the access road? How much additional run groundwater runoff will this cause? Has the town engineer or the appropriate body done a groundwater study to learn the impact this access road will have on groundwater runoff to the surrounding properties and compound the problems that already exist? We believe this should be done before application is made to the siting council. Who will be responsible for correcting the existing groundwater runoff problems and any additional problems caused during or after the tower access road construction? The applicant, the golf course owner, the town, or the paved driveway owner? Who will be responsible for road maintenance, both on Quarry Ridge Drive and the access road to the tower? Will this continue to be a private road or will the town take it over at some point? I'm almost done. <laughs> well, it was thought that emissions from towers were not harmful to the surrounding residents. Now there are many articles indicating that the radiation has caused, has caused major health concerns affiliated with these towers. I quote the following from one such article. The threat comes from the constant nature of the activity of the towers. They emit pulsed radio frequency radiation. This radiation has been shown in thousands of studies to cause biological damage to the body and to be a precursor to disease. It then goes on to identify some of the dangers besides cancer associated with emissions from the cell phone towers, including genetic mutations, memory disruptions, hindered learning, ADD, insomnia, brain disorders, hormonal imbalances, infertility, dementia, and heart complications. For all of the above reasons, 9 Rose Hill Road is not an appropriate location for this tower. I am hereby requesting that any and all Portland town officials involved in this matter, the applicant and especially the siting council be given all verbal comments and written communications from this meeting and any verbal or written communications from subsequent, subsequent sessions. It is important that the applicant and the siting council have all documentation and the history surrounding this site in order to make their decision. Sincerely, Phil and Sharon Hoy. Thank you, Sharon. Anyone else in row three? David? Hi, I'm David Favale. I live on Collins Hill Road. Um, just a couple quick questions. I would be curious why um, the tower location was considered near the golf course and then uh, your mind was changed, um, why, why it wasn't placed there. And then if any study has been done about what something like this does to property values. I can see it would have some value if we had no cell phone service whatsoever, a tower in the area would be nice. But I mean even I have AT&T and I have great coverage where I am and I'm probably the closest one to the proposed tower. So. Those are the only two questions or issues I would have. I think Thank what you. we'll do, thanks David, is um, after we finish with this side of the room, if the presenters wanted to address any of the questions, we can. Okay, so you're keeping notes. Thank you. Okay, so that was row three. Anybody else in row three? Sharon, you already had it. Oh. Yeah, I had two questions as a result of their presentation. Okay. Uh, the one is- you, Sharon, um, if you could, so oh, that sorry. everyone could hear you. Certainly. Thank Sharon you. Hoy, 33 Rose Hill Road. Um, the photos that you showed us um, sh were all taken during when the leaves were on the trees. Uh, what will this look at the other six months of the year is whenever there's no leaves on the trees? With the, um, sir, I believe it was a 50 by 50 foot square, it sounds like there's going to be um, quite an area, quite a, an area that would show from other locations um, on Rose Hill Road, Fairway Drive, uh, Ames Hollow, and it, it, 
I, I would be interested to, to know if that is going to be um, not a very good uh, thing to look at. Um, and then the other question is, uh, the proposed tower is going to be now 85 foot high. If that is the case, will there be an opportunity for expansion at some later time for other cell phone towers in the same site, as well as uh, an additional height being added to the 85 feet? Thank you. Anyone else in row three? The next row, four? We're standing? So n no more comments on this half of the room. My left, your right. Did you want to make any comments to the questions? Um, sure. Okay. Um, just very briefly, I'm not going to go in any particular order. Um, with respect to the comment uh, about leaf on visibility, um, for the Connecticut Siding Council, for that process, we would have to evaluate what we call leaf off conditions as well. Um, and depending upon when the application's filed um, and when the siding council schedules a hearing, there'll be a balloon float on the day of that hearing as well. So additional visibility studies would be done. Um, with respect to the compound, Mike, I don't anticipate visibility of the compound. Is that accurate? Do you want to maybe address that? Yeah. <coughs> the, uh, just so everyone understands, I know you saw... Oh, I'm sorry. Mike Libertine. I'm with All Points Technology. I was responsible for the uh, visibility analysis that's been submitted to date. I want to go back to one of the slides, the engineering slides, show the schematic for the what they call the tower profile. That's a little misleading because what we really try to show there is the, uh, it's really just a caricature to show you where the placement of antennas can go, the underlying monopole. My biggest point here is the entire facility from some point will be in faux branches. Um, so it's not going to be just spaced around the pole where the antennas are, as you see there. But more importantly, first to answer the question about the 50 by 50 foot compound, that's the base compound at the bottom here. The pole itself is about, well, with a monopine, they usually are about six feet in diameter at the base, and they taper up to about three and a half feet at the top of the tree. Uh, or the tree pole. So where this is located, and this may answer some of the uh, gentleman's question about why this site was selected as opposed to the site up, I think you meant up where it was introduced up by the, um, the parking lot in that area. I can't speak to the preference of the property owners, but I can say from my perspective, one of the reasons I really like this location was because it's, it's really buried in the middle of um, dense woods. And it's a pretty good mix of hardwoods as well as some conifers up there. But more importantly, the trees up in that area on the top of the ridge line are pretty substantial in height. They're all in uh, the 70, 75 foot range, some topping out close to 90 feet. So from my perspective, looking at it from a visibility standpoint, I like the idea of having all of that screening and buffer. And to get to your point, ma'am, the 50 by 50 foot compound is uh, really the tallest structure in that particular base uh, <coughs> area is 11 feet tall and that's the top of their um, equipment shelter that goes within there. So from anything really off of the golf course property, you're not going to see any of the base. As a matter of fact, from the work we've done to date, uh, really most of the views are from the west side looking back east as we had presented and really just looking at the top 10 or 15 feet above the trees. Now, you make a good point. Once the leaves come off the deciduous trees, obviously things open up a little bit. My guess is because, again, because of its location, and we'll be able to verify this in another probably six or seven weeks, you're going to see probably a little bit more of the conifer style tree. But again, the reason we are camouflaging it is because we have a great setting here. It's a relatively low tower, so it's actually going to look somewhat natural. I'm sure everyone has gone around and driven and seen some of the monstrosities that are out there, some of the early versions. And I think if you say, you know, the Hutchinson Parkway, everyone kind of goes, oh, gasp, that's the one I know. Interesting thing about that, I will agree with you. If you're on the Hutchinson Parkway and you drive by that, you go, what were they thinking? But if you drive to the north into the neighborhoods, 
from which that is supposed to do the screening, it actually works not too bad because it sets into the backdrop of the surrounding trees. If you stick a pole of 100 feet or even, in this case, 85 feet, somebody's going to see it. There's just, you know, we can't make them invisible. But the idea is to try to really find the right setting um, and get it in a proper, proper placement, proper height, and in this case, try to use some type of camouflaging that will work. Um, I think this is a good site from that perspective. Uh, will you see it from those locations generally uh, to the west on Bartlett Street and the golf course and those neighboring roads? There are going to be some locations like we've shown where, yeah, you're going to see the top of the facility. There's, there's no question about it. The other um, issue that I want to address briefly was the concerns about the, um, the runoff and, and consistent conditions. And we did get the comments from the town engineer. Um, so as we go through the process, and this is why these information meetings are very helpful, this is the kind of information that we take into account when we're designing our facility. We are proposing um, to use the existing driveway and golf cart, so existing um, access ways. Um, I'm not sure how much more we're going to extend that. It's not very long. Is that correct, Jay? It's about feet. it's about 300 feet, and the so the extension it would be an extension off um, the existing golf um, cart path um, about 300 feet, and that would be a gravel surface. But those kinds of engineering um, uh, reviews and calculations and so forth um, will be done as part of the siting council process. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to this side of the room. First row, any comments or questions? <coughs> Second row, yes. Just watch your step, there's cords there. Thank you. My name is Ginny Quinn. I live on 4 Greenview Drive. And as I was listening to the presentation, I just had a question. Um, and forgive me, I was writing feverishly, and I don't know if I have the right terminology, but um, you had mentioned in one of your graphs that the amount of, I guess, radio frequency radiation that will be emitted from your tower is 12.36% of the 100% federal guidelines. And you also indicated that more than one company can go onto your tower. So is that 12.36, the total amount that will be with that tower for its life, or as other companies kind of attach on, will that increase? And is there a cutoff? And questions about that. So, thank you. As I said, we'll answer the questions after all of them are presented, if that's mm -hmm. okay. Anybody else in row two? Row three? The next row, four? George? Good evening. Uh, I'm George Law. I reside at 64 Rose Hill Road, um, which is not, not far from the site. But I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of clients of mine. I'm a lawyer here in town, and I represent uh, John Kelly and Christina Kelly, um, who uh, reside at 1 Rose Hill Road, which is um, directly next to the site. And yeah, I brought a map, and I, and I drew on it. <laughs> um, I just want to show, if I can here briefly, Mr. and Mrs. Kelly's property is this property that's outlined in pink here. Is the property that's outlined in pink here. It's this bizarrely shaped property. Can everybody and see? You know what, George, maybe the middle? Or what do you think? There we go. That's good. Thank you. So Mr. and Mrs. Kelly's property is the property outlined in pink. And I, I've drawn on where I approximate their house, as you see, no, over, I'm sorry, not the pink stripes, just the pink parcel right here. So it comes up, this is, this is their frontage, and this is their property. I drew the house on, I think it's relatively accurate as to the location, but, but I just point out that's not going to scale, that, that was what I put on there. I'll, I'll just briefly, while I'm over here, show you the green outline parcel is, is Quarry Ridge, and it extends further further out here. This pink line property is property that's owned by uh, Jarvis Penfield. It's, it's not owned by the golf board there. Um, and then the Hoist property is right next to it. This parcel in the center, again, outlined by green, is the golf course property. And where I put the green circle here 
is, is the alternate site on the golf course property for this, this cell phone tower. The green lined property over here is the site where the tower is being proposed as of right now. So if you look at that, but for perhaps the Favales and some of the Nolan clan over here, the Kelly's house is as close as any to, to that property. So it, I, is it this? I think it's that. It's well, this one. It's an old map, so it doesn't represent the current. Right. This is the parcel on which the property is. This parcel was conveyed over to Quarry Ridge before it was conveyed to the current owner. And then the current owner purchased this property, or one of the current owners of Quarry Ridge Golf Course purchased this property in 2006. Um, not at the time that he purchased the golf course. It's a woodlot that he purchased following the purchase of the golf course. And that's the assessor's map uh, and lot number that were referred to earlier. So Mr. and Mrs. Kelly, as the Favales and other neighbors, I'm sure, are very concerned about the location of the uh, present uh, you know, site for this structure for a number of reasons. And, and, and their paramount concern, as I'm sure everybody's, is, is health. Um, and, and, you know, for all the research that can be done, and I don't purport to have done it, nor do I purport to be the person who would have the knowledge to opine on it, but it, it, there are no answers. And, and while there are no answers that say it's bad for you, there are no answers that say it's not for you. And in fact, everything that I've researched said there are no answers. There has not been adequate time to research this issue. These cell phone towers haven't been around that long. As we heard in the presentation, we're going from, I don't remember the numbers, but like 1 to 15. I mean, the, the increased use and the increased frequency and in radiation from these towers it is, is unknown, and the results of that from a health perspective are also unknown. So that's, that's a paramount concern to my clients. Secondary to that, although also important, are the aesthetics, the, the appearance of this thing to their property, um, the noise that's potentially going to come from, I presume there will be, will be generators, so if there are power outages, the structure can continue to run. Those generators have to, to raise noise. And then, of course, all of the concerns of, of the, um, the, the construction of the tower. Um, if there is an extension of the driveway, and I would suggest it's, it's, it's not rational to think that they're going to use the existing, you know, what, five and a half foot wide golf cart that, that golf carts barely fit on to bring in heavy equipment, you know, to, to, to build this structure and then heavy equipment to maintain it. Um, it, it. It doesn't make sense. There's going to need to be substantial improvements. There's going to need to be utilities brought out there, which, again, you know, the, the Kellys built their house there in, in a similar situation. They had to blast to put their utilities in. So I, I, I would imagine that that's something that's going to have to be done when this structure goes in, in as well. Now, all of this being said, my mother always used to say, don't complain about a problem if you don't have a solution. This, the, the, the alternate site on this property is in the center of this property. So if this property owner wants to facilitate the construction of a cell, cell uh, tower on his property, th that's fine. But don't do it to the detriment of the neighbors who's, whose yard, for all practical purposes, you're putting it in, when you can put it in the center of your property and it will have virtually no impact on neighbors. You know, everybody not in my backyard, but, but it, if, if you're the property owner who's going to cause the construction of this, well, how about in your backyard? Not to mention the cost of bringing utilities to it are, you know, are, are minimal. There's a utility easement, there's existing utilities right to that spot, and there's no need to extend any further roads. There's a parking lot there, access to the spot it is, is immediate. Um, that being said, I think the, the bigger issue, frankly, that, that needs to be faced here is this woodlot on which this property or the structure is being proposed is not part of the of the Quarry Ridge parcel um, as purchased. It's a woodlot that came, was purchased secondly and independent of the Quarry Ridge property and does not enjoy the same easement rights that the Quarry Ridge Golf Course does over my client's property, over Penfield, Jar uh, Jarvis Pen Penfield Jarvis's property, and over the Hoy's property. There are cross easements which are reflected here in the yellow, um, and again, a, a straight up utility easement that brings utilities straight up to the property. 
and, and if you, you look at these deeds, which I have, um, the owners, you know, the, the Kellys at their lot, the golf course, and the owner of this property, all have cross easements over this property to access their properties. But the easement rights that come with Quarry Ridge Golf Course, the parcel that was sold to Quarry Ridge Golf Course, do not extend to the parcel where you are proposing to construct this site. And therefore, there is no access to a tenant to, to this property to, to, to go in and, and construct the property, as there would be here. Those easement rights uh, are, are you know, run in favor of Quarry Ridge over these other lots to access the Quarry Ridge property. And therefore, a structure here is nothing that can can be, you know, denied access to. And in fact, we you know we propose that that's a, a reasonable site for it. The only reason, according to to the plan that was submitted, that that site was not considered is the owner of the property declined it. So he's declining to have it in the middle of his property where utilities can easily be brought, where there's access. No need to add any further, uh, you know, pavement that's going to cause additional water runoff you know, potentially. It, it's there and ready to go in the middle of his property, not impacting any of the surrounding neighbors. And not to mention, he's got access rights to this property to install it. He does not to this property. And look to the deed to this property. It's a separate woodlot purchased from a separate person. It simply does not have easement rights, and they can't be created by the fact that it's been purchased by the same person. So my clients oppose the, the, the construction of the site tower at this lot uh, for the reason said. Um, we think that constructing it over here, the other site that was considered in the site plan, makes perfect sense. Um, it, it's in the middle of the golf course, but it can be camouflaged there as, as well. Um, I think it's near the 13th green, if I'm correct. And, you know, nobody plays into the parking lot there the way they do with the course below. So I, I think it's an appropriate site there. Um, and, and I'm just being candid. My clients will oppose it. I think they're in, in very good standing to deny access to, to this lot by virtue of the way the easement language exists um, in the deeds for all of these properties. Thank you for your time. Thank you, George. Anyone else in the uh, one one moment? I just wanted to ask the back row, Mr. Satajay, if you could just is there anybody else that's seated? Bob? Sure, thank you. There is a hand up or no? Mark, did you raise your hand? Oh, okay, <laughs> you're waving. Hello, Robert Satajay, 111 Collins Hill, Portland, and um, I am. Uh, it, the irony is pretty unbelievable for Ms. Law to get up here and talk about how that um, water con construction is going to impact his client's property when we were here a few months ago arguing against his client doing the exact same thing with his driveway, which hasn't been addressed yet. So, and as Sharon, thanks for doing a great job with that petition and, and your comments. And, um, you know, and, and there you mentioned unbelievably the town hasn't done anything yet. This situation still goes on. We're talking about water, but yet we're playing with fire. Be additional construction up there to put that cell tower in is any um, upsetting of what's currently up there could have devastating effects for the residents below. It's already a grave situation. So when you're getting large trucks to go up there, uh, doing any adjustments to the landscape up there could be uh, proved to be very hazardous and perilous. And that's going to, you know, puts the town at risk. And um, the situation, the, the cell, tower, uh, cell tower owner, you know, is in a position now, or the proposed uh, cell tower, uh, is in a position to correct it, um, to do something about that water. You know, it's probably a result of the uh, golf course being put in incorrectly in the first place, which the town was probably involved with. You know, it's uh, an effect of not following policies and procedures correctly the first time and these are the results they just keep on cascading and escalating we're seeing the results of that now it's just getting worse and worse so um, the owner of uh, that property uh, you know the town engineer is aware of how that water comes down um, that the back of that hill the 75 foot ledge comes across the, um, that uh, new driveway up there which will probably erode in another couple years from that water but he can certainly redirect it uh, that water to uh, drainage pipes on that property. And um, why it hasn't been addressed in, in such a long time is uh, incomprehensible. 
So, but uh, any uh, additional changes to that property? I've been up there a million, uh, many times. Um, Sue, I'm sure you've walked the property up there. I hope you have taken a look, uh, take ownership of this problem. We need a leader to, to help us with this and not say it's uh, private property, I can't go up there because it's getting passed back and forth like a hot potato here. Um, so I, I hope you listen to the residents. We've come, we've come to uh, the town meetings many times, spoken to you directly. We all know about that problem, where it directly emanates from. Um, there's drainage systems on that uh, golf course property where that water can be directed to, resolve a lot of uh, a lot of the issues. Uh, but any further construction up there, uh, uh, changes to the golf cart. Um, there is a, a swale up there which all that water pulls up and collects and sort of a sink and you're going to ride um, heavy equipment over there and alter that it's going to uh, increase that water significantly down that hill and somebody's going to get um, you know p potentially could get injured from it and um, we don't want to see uh, you know then the, the town becomes liable and c creates more problems so that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on this side of the room? Are you ready for the comments? I, I just wanted to quickly address the question regarding the um, the maximum permissible exposure. Um, that that number, that twelve point three six percent, was for AT and T, um, and. As you know, it's, pro it's proposed for co-locators. So let's say another wireless carrier, let's say the site got built, um, another wireless carrier was seeking to co-locate on that tower. They would have to take, they'd have to do the same calculation. However, they'd have to take AT&T into account. So they would have to do a cumulative calculation and demonstrate to the siting council, who has jurisdiction over this, um, that they meet the standards. So any carrier that comes on to another facility has to do that cumulative calculation and make sure that altogether you're still under that 100 percent. It rarely ever does. I think, um, Sarah, ah, yes. <laughs> Dan, maybe if you want to talk a little bit about that just from your experience. Dan Goulet, um, representing AT&T. I'm with C Squared Systems out of um, Auburn, New Hampshire. Um, we have sites that have, in addition to five carriers, they have public safety, police, they could have an FM radio station on it. Um, this particular site, they're showing a five carrier pole. It is my strong opinion that it's very unlikely that five carriers will go on that because of the 10-foot spacing. The pole is only 80 feet high, 85 with the branches. So the first carrier is at 80. The next center line available is 70. And as you heard earlier from Mr. Libertine, the trees in that area are over 70 feet tall. So there's not going to be a third carrier that's going to want to be buried at 60 feet or a fourth carrier at 50 feet and be below the tree line because the signal's not going to propagate. Even if there was, as um, was mentioned earlier, the, the siting council looks at all of these, but it has never been the case that a five carriers on a pole would exceed 100%. Um, we're showing in this calculation 12.3%, uh, and that includes the technologies that, some of the technologies that AT&T will be potentially taking off the air. As these technologies come out, they're lower power than the, than the parent technologies, I'll call them, or the previous technologies. So that, that's the issue with these. It, they're very low power so that people aren't using up a lot of their batteries on their phones and the service lasts longer. Um, and so for that reason, there, if I added another carrier, and even if I went up and said that one's gonna be 15%, well, that's 
I add a third carrier who's now down at 60 feet in the trees, um, say that's another 15%. Well, now I'm still under 50%. And, and keep in mind that that calculation is at, if you're standing at the base of the tower with the antennas aimed at the ground, that doesn't happen. Once you move 10 feet away, we've gone out and done measurements. We do it all the time. We have some pretty sophisticated equipment. It's FCC type accepted and we will go to an area a tower, a building, a rooftop, and we will actually take measurements of the emissions. And 90% of the time, the levels that we record are below the minimum level for that meter where it's 100% accurate. So, and they're always much lower than what we run the calculations at. Because this is worst case scenario. This is assuming Every single channel is on the air at full power for every single technology all within <coughs> the same time frame. And that very rarely occurs. I, I just wanted to thank you for having us this evening thank and you giving us much. this opportunity. And thank everyone for coming out tonight and sharing that information with us. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, higher level, and, and also, can the other towers in town provide service to the same area? To um, with respect to height, yes, it could get taller. If if another carrier, let's say that the site is built, it's approved and it's built. If another carrier um, needed a higher height and wanted to extend it, they would have to demonstrate to the siting council that they needed that taller height. Um, and go to the siting council for approval on that. Um, with respect to the existing towers, um, I, I did have a map up that showed where uh, AT&T is located on all the existing towers. And no, none of them could provide service to that, that, whitish, that white area on the maps. Um, the first thing that AT&T does when they identify an area that needs service is to see if they can use existing infrastructure. Uh, it makes a lot more sense and it's a lot more efficient to place a facility on an existing structure, whether it's a tower or a water tank or a tall building, than to build a new one. So that's the first thing they do. And unfortunately, the, the existing towers in town don't provide service to this area. Any other questions or comments tonight? Yes, Mrs. Nolan. Pat Nolan from 17 Wildwood Road, the Nolan clan, as you said. <laughs> and we have lots of kids and all. What I'm concerned about is that 12.36, do they put that in? We also deal with power lines that go through there, the high power lines. Do the two of them put together? Do they, is that something CLMP and the, the tower works with? Does that add to your 12 point? Sir, would you mind going to, I'm sorry, to the uh, microphone? Thanks. Otherwise, we won't pick up your answer. And every answer, this is important as every question. If, if the tower were situated at the tension lines. No, it's like this. We can see well, it from no. our house. Line. Well, I, I mean, line and the tower. I mean, actually, the at the transmission lines. I think because we have the mapping of where the transmission <coughs> lines are compared to the tower, the proposed location, and they're a good distance away. We can put that up again if you like. No, I, I just wanted to know if it was. It, you, they don't. They, they don't, don't mix and and create greater. If if the tower and the antennas that the signals that we're putting out, for example, if we went on one of those transmission poles, mm -hmm. which is done, mm -hmm. carriers do stick there, and then you would, yes, you would include that. We would have to take a measurement to find the mm -hmm. actual reading. But they don't combine and amplify, if that's what you 
if you're asking. It doesn't Maybe work. they ought to do it. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> so the, the neighborhood doesn't get the whole of that. Thank you. Thank you. Sharon? In my letter. <laughs> Thank you. In my letter, I asked uh, what the other locations were that had been considered by the applicant and why they weren't appropriate uh, for, the so for the tower, and that wasn't answered. That, that was actually um, part of the presentation, and it was information that was provided in the technical report. What at t looked at was the existing um, power lines there, the existing CLMP infrastructure, and I had a, um, a slide up that showed the topography and why those didn't work. The RF engineers analyzed that and determined that it wouldn't, they wouldn't work, the existing structures. So that's, what, that's the first thing that they looked at. Are there other sites in town that would accommodate the tower? Uh, none that we know of. It, it would have to be in that area. Um, if there's, you know, that area that we showed on the plots where service is needed. Um, I'm not aware of any town-owned property in that area. We can certainly take another look and see. Um, but it, it, it's, a, it's a pretty limited geographic area where we'd have to um, look to provide service. I certainly make any information available to you that you need. Is Rick here? I don't know of any. Not in the immediate vicinity. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments tonight, George? Just, just one question sure. for clarification purposes. Yes. And maybe I misheard, but the other sites that were considered were ruled out for, for varying reasons. The other site up at Quarry Ridge was ruled out because the property owner didn't want it. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank can you. I, can yeah. I address that? Yes, Mr. Romano. I am the property owner, and it was not just my whimsical uh, desire to put it there. It was mainly visibility. If put in that parking lot, it would be much more visible. I said 84, I put tower in the parking lot would be visible all the way to Farmington on the, on the northwest, or northwest, and Glastonbury on the northeast. The views, if you go up, be my guest, come and take a look at the views from, you know, the top of the golf course, and you can see the Yukon Health Center, you know, and you can see over to homes on the top of hills in Glastonbury, the visibility would be greatly increased. Mike, just and that record. was and I and I think I don't want to speak for AT and T. I think that they thought the proposed site was better situated for the particular area that they wanted to reach. Mike, could you just for the recording secretary for the record state oh, your name and address? My name is Michael Milano. I reside at 167 Cox Road, and I'm the owner of Quarry Ridge Golf Course. Thanks, Mike. Any other comments? <laughs> We're going to close the public. Susan. I'm sorry, Sharon. Sharon Hoy, 33 Rose Hill. Uh, what about the area up where the where the power lines are? Could that be an appropriate location? It's in that that same vicinity. And also, are there any state-owned land that can that it can reside on, in the same area? I'm not aware of any state-owned land in that vicinity, but we can certainly take a look and see. Um, like I said, it's a limited geographic area. Um, I do know any, and I don't believe there are any state parks in that area, but we would, we would be precluded from siting in a state park. Um, the CLMP lines that I showed on, the, um, on that topographic map, because of their location at a much lower elevation, um, anything there would not work for AT&T, but we can certainly take a look and see if there are other properties in the area. David? Just real quick, Mike, and don't think I'm putting you on the spot. I just want to understand. You didn't want it up on the top 
because the visibility from the people out there looking in, like from Farmington and Glass, I, I get the great views, I love it up there. But is, it, is that the visibility you're talking about from the people out there that would see it looking towards the course? Or did I just not understand? Yeah. No, it, it was just immediately obvious that the tower would be visible farther in all directions at that location. It would not be in the middle of the woods. It would be a tower visible from top to bottom. Um, where in the woods now, as they said, the trees from 70 feet and below, even in the winter time, since it's quite deep in the woods, would be, you know, obscuring any view of the lower parts of the tower and uh, you, you saw the slides and what it would look like in the summer. Thank you. Good. Yeah, I, I think the perfect oh. example. One person at a time. Oh, wow. We'll give you a chance. This is Ruth McGowan. 42 Collins Hill Road. Where did the balloon go up? On which piece of property? Was it the golf course or was it? That would be a question for... Um, this gentleman it, it is it is golf course property um, but I don't know specifically the lot I think that's all been kind of condensed into the or, or at least incorporated into the, the golf course proper was I guess the question yeah. where Ruth, was the balloon where was the balloon placed where, so the it, it's right where the tower was Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we went into the woods to the actual center line of where it's proposed. proposed? Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. I misunderstood the question. Yes, we snaked it up. We did actually snake it up through the existing trees. So before I get to you, this well, we, lo we lost um, a couple on the way up. What I want to what I want to do, we do this with all our public hearings. We go to the podium and ask the question or the comment. It keeps everybody given the same opportunity, so we don't have a back and forth. You go up to the podium and ask your question. Did you want to state something? You sure? Okay. Mr. Nolan? Tom Nolan, 17 Wildwood Road. Uh, somebody mentioned the uh, state property. Um, I believe there's a state property with a uh, high, very high elevation uh, right next to engine company number three. That would be a possibility. I mean, the, D, the um, that's a DEEP site. Yes. Is that right, Rick? Yes. Yes. Now that is on Great Hill Road in Portland. Which, how close is that to the site, Rick? Quite some distance. Elevation-wise, it might be similar. Elevation-wise, it would be Elevation similar, but it's not similar. right in the neighborhood. But it is a state-owned parcel, and that's Great Hill Road behind company three we can get you that information okay thank you the density there is much less population mm -hmm. Sharon has the recycling center been uh, would the, would that be close enough and since that's town owned would that be an appropriate site you know, the, that's all for the, the people to look at. I don't know the elevation of that site. That is certainly a town-owned site, and we can, through the public works and the planning departments, make available any maps that you need um, in terms of, of siting, um, as we would do for anyone. Okay. Uh, let's see, I guess you're next, George, and then, is it Mrs. Milano? No. no. Okay. <laughs> I won't assume anything. Don't go there. Okay. And this will be my last, but, but just, again, George Law on behalf of, of John and Christina Kelly. Sorry. As for the uh, other site up on, on Quarry Ridge, which is on Quarry Ridge, and I beg to differ with that, that it's all golf property, the proposed site is a, is, is a separately deeded parcel of land. It is not part of Quarry Ridge Golf Course. It does not enjoy the same easement rights as Quarry Ridge Golf Course. However, that being said, Mr. Milano, now that you've heard your neighbors opposing the site next to their properties, perhaps a balloon can be floated in the center of the golf course at this alternate site. I'm hearing there's big concern about the trees blocking lower 
usage on this tower, if we put it in the parking lot of the golf course, I'm imagining there's no trees blocking any type of, of radiation coming in and out, therefore making the tower a more viable option for anybody who wants to go on there. And, and we're being told it's going to look like a tree and nobody's going to really notice it, so it doesn't really much matter what the views from out of town are, um, or for, for that matter from the golf course, if it's just going to blend in and, and look so great, and then it can be used at, at every level for your transmissions. So I'd like to see a balloon floated there, perhaps maybe, so that that site can be considered. And then, um, you know, the, the, the neighbors whose yard this will actually practically be in um, will be appeased. Um, and again, I would suggest it's a better site because you would then have access to it. Thank you, George. Yes. I'm Kathy Fox, and yes, I do live at the same address that Mike Milano <laughs> lives at, but, and I'm, I'm relatively new to Connecticut, so I almost don't have a, a reason to comment. So I'm listening as a new person here and as an outsider, so I'm just kind of hearing that there's a few other things going on, and so, and I'm understanding as little as I can. It seems like there's another issue about something else with, a, a, it sounds like a very serious problem with water drainage. So it sounds like th this is a big issue. And then there's something else happening in that same area. And I can, un you know, I can imagine the panic. So as this new outsider, I can see how it's feeling like, oh my God, it's going to be more intense. So I'm thinking, well, maybe some something should be addressed to, you know, the one thing, and then look at the other and see if, you know, I'm not even finishing my sentences, <laughs> but I think you get my gist that it sounds like something out there needs to be addressed first, and then think about the other thing and see if it impacts. And that's thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. Any other comments? If not, I want to thank our presenters. I think uh, many, many questions are answered and more information was shared. It's very much appreciated. As far as the public hearing is concerned, um, it is now closed. It is 8.32. And um, you did hear from the presenters there is additional hearing should this go forward to the Siting Council. and. Um, I trust that the applicant will keep information coming to the town and we'll do our best to make sure that's available to anyone and everyone as we go forward. So we're going to take a brief recess. And again, thank you, everybody, so we can uh, clean up the uh, video and so forth. Thank you. Thank you.